Hi, I'm Dirk Reynolds, and the march, What's Nate, starts right now. The What's Neat Show is sponsored by Caboose, sharing our passion for trains since 1938. This is the What's Neat Show for March 2018. I'm your host Ken Patterson and this month we've got a great show. First of all, for layout construction, I do an update on my BTS log mill diorama, whereas we lay the HON3 code 70 track on the diorama this month and I show you the process on how to go about doing that. Also this month Jason Quinn stops by and shares with us his techniques for making very inexpensive coal loads for our HO scale freight cars and in fact this will work in any scale. Korea Brass, we look at their brand new track cleaning tool. It is a vacuum cleaner track cleaner all in one unit. It's a pretty impressive model to see this month on What's Neat. Also we look at the brand new ON30 060 locomotive from Bachman. It's the first time I've shot one of their models in over a year and I take you on that photo shoot and show off this gorgeous little tea kettle of a model that I think is going to be very well received by modelers in that community. Also finally we look at Athern's CA1 and CA2 Challenger locomotives. It's an absolutely exquisite model in HO scale. It comes in eight variations and I show you all of them on the show this month as I do a photo shoot for that project. We've got some great drone footage from Stephen M. Conroy. I can only describe it as mountain and tunnel jumping in California. It's absolutely incredible footage to witness this month. And that's the lineup for this March 2018 What's Neat. For this segment of What's Neat, I wanted to give you an update on the BTS log mill diorama project that I had been working on. We last updated it in the June of 2017 What's Neat, where I showed you the bench work going together, and it was a very nice project up to that point. To start with on this month, I needed to remove the existing track on the trestle module diorama to be able to lay new track at the correct curvature to mate with the log mill diorama. I sanded the transition between the modules with 36 grit sandpaper, ensuring perfect vertical alignment of the rails across the joint. I then test fit two Shinohara number no. 6 turnouts to divide the HON3 trackage from the trestle diorama. I used the Microengineering Code 70 weather track for this project. Before assembling the track with Atlas N scale rail joiners, and soldering everything together, it is very important to clean the weathering off of the track ends with a Dremel wire brush to ensure reliable electrical conductivity between the sections. I took my time cutting the rails, curving the track, and installing the turnouts, wire brushing each rail to remove the weathering, and then installing rail joiners and temporarily lining everything up for smooth operation. I used masking tape and heavy weights to keep the track from sliding around as I bent the sections and formed the curves on into the sidings. It took about three hours to form a track pattern that made operational sense to me, and then with a purpose and function that would be in relation to the buildings that set adjacent to the sidings. Once everything was laid and taped into place, I began soldering all the track on the diorama surface with rosin core solder. I painted the pink foam with latex house paint to seal it and then began gluing the track into place with a painter's knife applying a thin coat of liquid nails adhesive. I installed Caboose Industries 
and scale ground throws to each of the Shinohara number 6 turnouts to control these switches. These will be glued into place, set center with Wather's goo, and then further spiked into place to ensure that they will stay without sliding around. I painted all the track and the right-of-way with Rust-Oleum Camouflage Brown Paint, eliminating the white color of the liquid nails adhesive and giving a nice color to the sides of the rail and covering the bright silver solder joints around the entire layout. Okay, so now that we've got all of our track laid on this section of the layout, the one thing that you're going to notice is that this is a loop. And what happens in a loop is, of course, as it comes back together onto the single track onto the trestle, I'm going to have a short right here. So well, ordinarily what I would do is I would put a double pole, double throw switch into a section of track. So as the locomotive got into position, I would flip the polarity of this section of track and be able to reverse it so there's no short. But because we're going to use DCC on this narrow gauge portion of the layout, I have put a Digitrack AR1 which is simply an automatic polarity switch that as the train gets onto this section of rail which is gapped from about here I've got a good length so I could fit three locomotives in there if I wanted to so this area here will automatically change polarity eliminating the short and eliminating the need to use a double pull double throw switch so I've put that in and I have wired it up here and it simply wires up two wires off of the power track which will be powered all the time and then it runs through the system and these two wires go into the section of rail that's been completely gapped and isolated so that the reversing of the polarity in the decoders can take place. Now this unit I've got it mounted on top just to illustrate this in video and what I'll do is I'll sink these wires through brass tubes into the foam and I will mount this up underneath the foam tucked up safe because I really won't have to get to it, but if I need to, it's still there on the bottom, clear, no problem. So I can take this outside, photograph it, and this will remain safe up in the module. So at this point, let's continue on with the rest of the scenery on this section of layout. And with the track laid and cleaned, I test ran a train around the loop. Now in a future episode of What's Neat, we will finish the sides of the module, carve out the log mill pond, build some of the buildings, and add power blocks to the yard tracks. And with that, that ends this segment of layout construction on What's Neat. For this segment of What's Neat, we've got something pretty neat, and I will say something that you don't see every day, and just looking at it, what is it? Well, this is a model from Korea Brass, and what it is, it's a track cleaning car. And this thing weighs quite a bit. I want to guess, just guessing, there's at least two pounds here, and I didn't weigh it, and I should have. The thing comes apart, and I'm going to show you a couple things about it before I put it on the track, and that is it's got a vacuum cleaner in it, and it's got a drive motor in it, and a board in it and a compartment where all of the things you vacuum up get placed. The roof is die cast and it gets held on by magnets, which is really cool. We've covered magnets on the show before. We're gonna cover some more again. And this clips right into place. Now it's got a functional grill work here because that's actually the exhaust filtration for the vacuum cleaner. And it's got a paper filter in it here. And the model comes with one paper filter in the box in addition to the one that's already on the model. But the instructions explain that you can also use coffee filter material to replace with that, which is kind of convenient. The model also comes with additional KD couplers, which are not mounted to the model when you receive it, because it's not really something that you're going to pull a train with. This is going to be your maintenance away piece of equipment, so you have the option of couplers or no couplers. Now there's a cleaning pad underneath in the intake area for the vacuum cleaner right here, which is quite large, and there's additional 3M abrasive track cleaning pads in the box that come with the unit. So what I want to do now is I want to put this on the track and let it run around the room one time and find out what it will pick up. I've got a throttle here set up to number three, which is what this locomotive is set for. And if I hit F2, there's only two functions on the model. The first function is F1, which will turn on and off the vacuum unit, which I will let you hear now. And the second function is F2, which turns a little flashing beacon light on top here, which you can't see very well because I've got such bright lights down here at the moment. So essentially what I want to do is I want to take this around the layout. 
The one thing I do enjoy about our model railroads is occasionally as you walk around every three or four months you might find parts of little models that fall off, which I've always found to be kind of interesting to find out what you'll find. But with this, I'd like to find out what is and going to end up inside of the vacuum container after we run it around my 157 foot main line. So with that, I'm going to switch its direction and let it go. I think I'm running it backwards right now, by the way. The front of the locomotive is the other end. So I let the Korea Brass track clean tool, and that's what this is, this is a tool, I let it run around the layout three times all the way around, and then I proceeded to open up the unit to see exactly what it captured on my main line, and I think I keep my track pretty clean. But what I found here is a lot of ballast, and a lot of cat hair, and ground foam, but what I'm really surprised about is actually the cat hair. I had no idea that it would pick up this much cat hair in that area just between and around the railroad ties. That was an eye opener for me. But also what I did was I took the unit and I set it up over in the shop on a table and I put what I thought would be the most common elements that end up on my track and that's ballast or maybe ground foam and then it's the ceiling tile material that falls off the ceiling tile. And then I proceeded to run the unit slowly on a three foot piece of track through all the material. And it sucked up the ground foam and you could hear it actually sucking up the rocks, the gravel, the ballast. And it also went through and sucked up the uh, ceiling tile. And then as I looked at the unit, it actually cleaned the area of trackage around the ground foam very well. It also cleaned the area where the ceiling tile was very clean. It left some of the ballast, but it still picked up a lot. And the fact is, I would say that this thing is pretty much a success. It would be great for tunnels. I could see its use in a switch yard running between all the freight cars. And I wanted to also clarify the weight of this. And I'm gonna weigh it right now. And it weighs out at one pound and 11 ounces. So it's a pretty hefty model. So check it out, the Korea Brass track cleaner, vacuum cleaner. It's a pretty neat, pretty neat tool. Another thing just to improve the performance of all of our model railroad track. And so that's this segment on what's neat. this segment of what's neat I got a beautiful ON30 engine from Bachmann now this is the first time in over a year that I've shot a Bachmann shot using one of their models and I've set up a mountain scene here and some pine trees and a body of water just to create a really nice shot for this number five an 060 locomotive in ON30 which will be announced right around the same exact time that you're watching this video this is their cover shot that I'm setting up for their 2018 cover and I've got some mountains and a whole bunch of pine trees and like I said a body of water and a lot of little weeds and a person just to make the shot have a person in it. It always makes a photograph more interesting and an old newspaper trick that I learned a long time ago. But otherwise here's the shot, the way it's set up 
And now I can show you the way the final photograph came out. This is going to be an up and down shot, a real nice tall photograph. Beautiful locomotive, ON30. I need to build a project layout for this uh, scale. It just sounds like something I want to do. So otherwise, here's another cool photo shoot. I've got to show it to you first. Brand new on the market, this 060 ON30 locomotive from Bachman. And that's what's neat this week. episode of what's neat uh, I'm Jason Quinn once again and uh, Ken showed you one way to do uh, freight car loads more particularly coal loads and uh, ore loads with expandable foam and a trash bag but today I'm going to show you how to do it another way because in this hobby there's infinite ways to get stuff done so I'm going to show you how to do it with some layout scraps everybody's kind of got this blue foam on their layouts left over and uh, we're going to use that I'm going to show you kind of the items that you're going to need first off. Um, you're going to need a sanding block, sandpaper, an X-Acto knife, Sharpie, any sort of disposable paintbrush will work. This uh, is black sandblasting media from the hardware store. You can buy like a 50 pound bag of this for about $8 or so. It looks really good. Um, any sort of white glue, doesn't have to be tacky glue, and any sort of black acrylic paint. We're going to start off, there will be a couple ways you can do this. I actually have a pre-made cola that I know will fit into my car. So the first thing you can do is just trace your coal load. Kind of get somewhat of a square and just mark it. like so and then just trim inside your sharpie line and that'll be your coal load or if you don't have a load like this one you can take your freight car that you're going to put it in and uh, flip it upside down and roughly trace around the edge you don't want to go right up against your freight car because well if it's not black you don't want to get black sharpie on it this method here will require more sanding, but it's a good start. So, with that said, you can kind of see the difference in the two of them. Now we're going to cut them out. And I'm going to do that with an X-Acto knife because I want a clean cut. I don't want it... A saw like this will give you a rough cut. Right now we want a snug fit of the load in the car. So this will make a rough cut and I don't want that. I want it smooth. So we're just going to score it with an X-Acto knife until it breaks free. Now that we have the piece roughly cut out, we need to sand it with the block. Sanding with the block makes sure that your angle stays straight. So we're going to start sanding this and get it to fit. Now that we have the load in the car, the next step is to mark the top of the load basically just follow the line across the top of your car all the way around this will give you an idea of your coal peaks where they need to be so now that this is done what we're going to do is we're going to pull this out and this is where you need to decide whether you're going to have like a flood loader or a tipple load uh, flood load uh, would have more of a uniform look all the way across in the coal tipple loads um, like my chassis system uses will have the peaks 
So what we're going to do is I'm going to come underneath here and give me some rough estimates where I'm going to trim. So I'm going to do three peaks. So we're going to do something similar to this. It doesn't have to be precise. It's not rocket science. So now that we have this done, now we're going to use the more aggressive knife. Now that we've got our, uh, our uh, humps drawn out, I'm going to carve them. And I actually decided to go to a little bit less aggressive knife, which is just your common household kitchen steak knife. And uh, we're going to carve it. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to try and... We're not going to worry about the humps going this way just yet. We'll do that with sandpaper. We're just wanting to get rid of the of the, get the valleys cut out. There's a couple different ways that we can do this here. Um, you can take the knife and bevel these down or sand them down, whatever you prefer. Keep in mind though, the more material you take out, the more brittle these are gonna be and you don't wanna break it. So you're gonna need to be handling this thing carefully at this point. And what we have here is uh, basically our, our peaks and uh, now we're just going to round off the peaks with sandpaper. Once you get the load looking pretty much how you want, and this is up to your preference, um, just always remember you need to test fit sand, test fit sand, until you get what you want because you can always sand more off but if you sand too much off you're you're cutting a new piece so this was pretty much where we want it to be we set it down in the car and this is what we have to work with okay now we're to the painting stage and we're going to apply the coal um, i'm going to take the the white glue and the black acrylic paint and i mix them together into black white glue and what we're going to do is we're going to brush this on. You probably want to use a little bit smaller brush than what I have here, but this is what I have. So that's kind of what this project is, make the best of what you got. And we're going to paint this on. Be kind of liberal with it, but try and stay off the edges the best you can. Because you don't necessarily want the coal sticking to the edge of the load because it will have interference with the side of the car uh, fitment. So once you get that done, you grab your black sandblasting media from the hardware store and sprinkle it on. Get that out of there. And be liberal with this because the stuff that you're the stuff's not actually touching the glue we're going to reclaim and put it back into the pot because there's no reason to waste it. And that's pretty much it. We'll uh, take this, knock it off a little bit, get the excess off. Obviously you'd want to let yours dry before you do this, but for a film this is what we're going to do. And here we have it. And these two cars right here have foam loads in them. Like I said, this is a simple project. You're just using extra stuff left over from the layout room. In the afternoon, you'll have some good-looking coal loads, and that completes this segment of What's Neat. Hey, Ken. This is Gerald Mabry. Hi, I'm Abdulaziz. We're in Kuwait, and, and you're, you're watching, watching What's, what's Neat. Neat.
this segment of What's Neat. I'm outdoors doing another photo shoot. It's just a little chilly out here, but I want to talk about storing figures. Now, you know, we all use people on our layouts, and in HO scale, I use a multitude of figures to do my photo shoots, be it workmen or summertime figures or horses or just any type of situation that I might get for a scenario for a photograph where I need people. And I've used tackle boxes in the in the past to try to store these things but they're so cumbersome and what I've discovered are these little pill boxes that are available at your drugstore and these are perfect because you can categorize your people just as I've described in these little compartments you only open up one at a time so there's no risk of dumping all of them out so if you put the people on your layout and you want to change the seasons or what have you it's very easy just to go to this box and get the ones that you need out of it now the name of the show is what's neat and without to disappoint I've got something really neat today I'm doing a photo shoot outdoors with Athern's brand new locomotive fresh off the press and these are pre-production models that I've just received these are the new Athern Challenger CSA 1s and CSA 2 locomotives now these things come in eight different variations as you'll know Union Pacific had a total of 105 Challengers in their fleet but these are numbered the first number that Union Pacific received was a 3900 through 3914 class in 1936. They came with single stacks. And then a year later, Union Pacific then received 3915 through 3938. And these locomotives were a second group that were made, of course, in 1937, according to the history that I've read. These things were really experimented with a lot. The ALCO and Union Pacific officials worked together on these projects, and UP made the ALCO folks do stuff that they really didn't want to do because they were set in their ways. But a lot of new ideas were developed in these locomotives which were designed to replace two locomotives running together double-headed or the 210-2s, two that the, or 212-2s that the Union Pacific had at, at the time, which were single long locomotives. So the articulated design was their concept that they figured out was able to work the Wasatch Mountains and work those grades. And so Athern has absolutely done a beautiful job of representing these locomotives. They also had 39, 34, and 39 through 39. Those are passenger locomotives that the Union Pacific had purchased. Same type of structure, same locomotives. These had 69-inch drivers on them, and Athern has recreated that effectively, too, on these models. In 1943, Union Pacific started converting these to oil tenders, oil burners, and so Athern has created both the oil and the coal burner locomotive, and in fact, there was so much confusion at the time when they started converting these locomotives from oil to coal, Union Pacific had to go through and change all the number schemes of their of lo locomotives. And so Athern has represented the 3700 class, the 3800 class, and 3900 class series of numbers in these locomotives. They've got three different pilot variations. They come with coal or oil tenders. They come in single stack and twin stacks. And of course, they have two different styles of Union Pacific lettering on these models. So I just wanted to share them with you. I'm out doing photographs of them right now. I can show you the beautiful shots, if I haven't already, of the way these look. But they're just something really special to look out for. Athern's creating eight variations of this gorgeous Union Pacific Challenger steam locomotive. So check it out and that's this segment on What's Neat. All of the model railroad products seen in this episode of What's Neat are available through Caboose in Lakewood, Colorado or order online at mycaboose.com.